Okay, <coughs> first of all, welcome to the class. I'm excited to uh, have a whole new group of you this semester. Hopefully this class will not be too terribly painful and boring for you. And in an effort to make sure that it's not too terribly painful and boring, what I'd like to do is start this lecture by addressing the overall question that we should be asking in this class, which is, where does morality, where do values, where do ethics fit into policy analysis? There are some obvious places and some not so obvious places. We're going to start by talking generally about what role morality can, might, maybe should play in the overall project of trying to decide on what policy options to take. And that will lead us into a little bit of discussion of something that's much more about professional ethics. We're not going to get into um, sort of details of professional conduct kinds of things. Things about what kind of contact you can have with lobbyists or clients or that sort of thing. But we will get into questions about what relationship you as an individual, a person with your own moral sense and conscience, should have to you as a person playing a role as a policy analyst. So, the first question, and Amy really deals with this, is where is the morality in policy analysis? There is a model of policy analysis that takes it to be a purely technical project, purely a matter of taking questions and using a interdisciplinary panoply of tools to address them in <clears throat> in a fact-based manner, to bring the tools of the social sciences to bear on pressing questions of policy. And this is not supposed to be a project on a lot of understandings of policy, where anyone's morals or values uh, or concerns of that kind come into play at all. So this is the kind of model of something like an economist might take him or herself to be doing. Economists will typically tell you that, um, at least qua economist, morality doesn't come into it. They can tell you whether a minimum wage raise in some circumstance is likely to depress employment. But in and of itself, economics won't tell you whether that's right or wrong. It'll just tell you what it will do to other economic factors. You might be led to a particular moral position because of your beliefs about economics, in part because of your beliefs about economics. But the project itself is not supposed to be morally laden. As Amy, though, and a lot of other people point out, you can't really banish morality from policy decisions quite that neatly. Any sort of project as complex as policymaking in a modern state or a modern corporation or a modern NGO that touches on so many issues is not going to be susceptible to a purely technical, purely value neutral solution in a lot of cases. So where should we be aware of morality slinking its way into our nice, cool, technical, value neutral policy analyses? The first place is in the way that you frame the problem. And in a lot of ways, you can see almost everything else I'm going to say as various species and varieties of the issue of how you're going to frame the problem. So just to take a couple ripped from the headlines, at least at the time I'm recording this, examples. If you look at a situation like Syria, the kind of policy options you're going to consider if you take if you frame the problem as how do we get rid of Bashir is going to be somewhat different than if you frame the problem as how do we bring democracy, democracy to Syria or how do we stabilize Syria or how do we best protect uh, civilians in the Syrian conflict. 
different ways of approaching the problem are going to lead to different ways of answering it in a lot of cases. And the ways that you approach the problem, the way that you frame the problem is, is very often going to reflect your set of values, reflect what you think is important, what you take to be interesting, um, and what you think the priorities in a situation should be. There are a number of other places where moral judgment might end up coming into play, or values might end up coming into play in a policy decision. Specification of the details is another big, broad area where things will come in. There are often judgment calls to be made in specifying the details of a policy. This is particularly important when we're thinking about the interface between more general policy directives and more specific policy directives. So take something like the recent health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, however you, you want to, to call it. At one level, you have Obama running for president in significant part on a platform of reforming health care. And that's great, you know? Everybody, I think pretty much everybody on both sides of the aisle agrees that there ought to be some kind of reform for health care, right? Of course, whether or not you pick Obama's flavor of reforming health care, or um, at the time McCain's or going forward Romney's flavor of reforming health care, makes a big difference. And of course, it's going to be based on what kinds of values you take. Now, drilling down, Obama <clears throat> had some specifics, some general kinds of things about how he was going to reform health care that he laid out in his platform when running for office. It's not going to be a socialized medicine single payer system. It's going to use the um, it's going to use the existing insurance system to some degree. Uh, however, it will cover everyone. That sort of thing. Now, infamously, when you try to put this into Congress, you get a 900 some odd page bill that specifies a lot more details. The Affordable Care Act is so long because. You know, Obama's platform you could probably write in a couple pages, but there's a lot left to be said about how you're actually going to do health care. There's all sorts of things in the Affordable Care Act about how Medicare waivers are going to work, how Medicare funding and Medicaid funding is going to work. Uh, sorry, it should probably be Medicaid waivers. How S-CHIP is, is going to interface with all of this. All right, so you get a 900-page thing, and there's going to be a lot of judgment calls involved in translating Obama's very g general thing into the more specific bill. And then, of course, when it gets in the hands of the agencies, you have thousands and thousands of pages of very specific details about how this is to be implemented at the state level, at the federal level, You know what's going to have to go into different kinds of plans. All of this is being done by various uh, state health agencies and by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level. Thousands and thousands of pages of specification, again, that involves various kinds of judgment calls, many of which will at least be partly value-laden. They're not going to be just what saves us the most money, and even if they are, we'll get to that in a second. That's a value judgment. So you can imagine this process. You know, this is sort of the way democracy is supposed to work, right? The people decide we want health care changed. And then this gets translated into a mandate for the president and everybody else implements it. But the implementation is not simple. There's a tremendous number of details at each stage as you go from the sense of the majority of voters that they want health care to be changed in some relatively unspecified way, to Obama's platform, to the bill, to all the agency codes and regs, to every decision that's going to be made by, uh, you know, insurance companies and hospitals and doctors and yada 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 there are judgment calls value laden potentially value laden judgment calls at each step of the way as things are specified okay going to be judgment calls included in who you identify as stakeholders whose interests ought to be taken account of i happen to work primarily on international issues and when you start talking about wars this becomes a big issue um, we all like democracy, or most of us like, uh, maybe 
majority of us like democracy. Lots of people like democracy, right? Um, but things get a little bit weird when you start thinking about something like the war in Iraq. In some sense, at least in the noblest rhetoric around it, the interests of the Iraqis were supposed to be served by this. But we didn't treat them the way we treated the Americans, right? We didn't, they didn't get to vote on it the way that we got to vote on whether the U.S. goes to war. So who you take to be the relevant stakeholders says a lot about what you value, what you prioritize in a particular situation. Who you think should have a say in the decision and whose interests and how they ought to be counted. How you define success. This is very closely related to how you frame the problem. But definition of success, I'm going to hammer this in memos because the way you define success is often at least half the ball game in terms of what answer you're going to give. If you tell me that success with respect to the Iranian nuclear program means Iran never gets a nuclear weapon, that opens up and closes up a space of value, a space of policy options very different than if we say success is Iranian nuclear material never falls into the hands of a terrorist group. Some policy options will be the same with respect to both definitions of success. Some will be different. We're likely to come, we're likely to favor a different one depending on how we understand success. Also tied to the options, how you select which options are reasonable, how you define that. You're never going to consider every, every possible conceivable option for solving a policy problem. You're never going to write a memo that includes everything you could think of possibly doing, right? To take, <clears throat> to take a, a, a somewhat silly example, you're not going to write a policy memo for anyone in your career where you start with um, what should we do about the recession and say, well, one of the, you know, one of the policy options is uh, we could all prey on it really hard, right? In the context of our current politics, that's not going to be taken seriously as a policy option, but it reflects a certain understanding of what's important, what's likely, um, that not everyone is going to share. <clears throat> Standards and methodologies for evaluation. If your standard that you use for evaluating a process is cost-benefit, you're saying something about what you value. You are ratifying the kind of value system that is implicit in economic analyses of things. Economic efficiency, you're saying, is something that you value over other kinds of considerations. Um, sometimes maybe you should. Sometimes you'll do it alongside other things, but there's a value judgment embedded in the use of the tool. And finally, in a lot of cases, at the end of the day, <clears throat> the best you're going to be able to say about different policy options is that each of them have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. When you are speaking or writing to a principal, or if you are a principal, you're going to want to be as clear as possible about what the pros and cons of each option are. But at the end of the day, you're going to be picking one. And there's often not going to be anything like a formula for picking one. So if you're faced with an option that is um, higher risk uh, and higher reward versus lower risk and lower reward, or if you're looking at an option that you feel is fairer but less compassionate, or an option that will um, make the country safer at the expense of individual, some degree of individual rights. There's not going to be a formula. You're going to be balancing multiple considerations and what you choose will itself in some way reflect uh, your own values in the choice. All right, so given all of this, uh, you know, Amy sort of somewhat ironically casts his eye on all of these ways in which morality does in fact play a role in policy analysis, even if we would like to pretend that it doesn't. What would be the benefit of spending more time paying explicit attention to these, to, to these kinds of value judgments involved in policy decisions? 
none of this should be too mysterious. One is, if we are explicit about the values, we're better able to think about whether or not they're right. It may be at the end of the day that you decide, yeah, you know, cost-benefit analysis really is the best way, technically, morally, however you want to think about it, to address all problems, this particular problem, or whatever. But being explicit about the fact that when you use cost-benefit analysis, you are doing certain things. You are assuming that um, good is identifiable with um, money in some in some way, to some extent. You are assuming that values are transferable and comparable amongst people, right? You, for instance, you're assuming that, that Kant is not right, that people have infinite value, and so you can't trade off one person's good against another's. You might think all of that's great, and exactly the way we should do it. Making it explicit makes it possible to better assess that, to come to a more responsible way of understanding um, what kinds of values we're using and making sure as best we can that we're using the correct ones. On the flip side, hopefully if everyone's explicit, it makes it more possible, easier for us to understand and address conflicts of values. Probably all of us have had at some point an experience of having what seems to be an intractable argument with somebody. And then you have a sort of a aha moment where you say, oh, the reason we've been having this fight and that we haven't been able to resolve it is I've been assuming that everybody values X over Y and they assume that everyone should value Y over X. Um, so it can help with understanding those things. It may not always help with resolving them, right? So um, take something, take an intractable, well, hopefully not completely intractable, but, you know, a difficult to tract, uh, very moralized argument in the U.S., something like abortion, right? It doesn't end the argument to realize, oh, well, we just disagree about when life begins. Or it doesn't end the argument to, to realize, oh, um, you know, I'm value, I value the autonomy of the adult woman much more highly than whatever kind of life the fetus has. And, uh, you know, the person I'm talking to, ta talking to is a different kind of view. But it will at least clarify it. It might show room for compromise. It might at least it might show you a way you can agree to disagree, or it might at least keep you from futilely arguing about things that are never going to change the other person's mind because what's really going on is a value conflict. Somewhat ironically, and uh, Amy draws attention to this, if the ideal of the policy analyst is to be objective and value neutral, being explicit about values may actually help with that. It's easy to tell yourself that you are merely being objective or merely being pragmatic when really your own values are playing a very large role. Um, we all like to believe that we're right about things. We all are committed to our values. And for all of us, our values often are in the background. This is similar to what I was saying about the, um, or what Aristotle says about the merely continent versus the virtuous person. The truly virtuous person is not tempted by evil, and in most of our lives, most of the time, we, act, we, we, we aren't tempted to act against our values. We don't face a lot of moral dilemmas, and so it's easy to forget that they're there and they're operating. Um, so drawing that out, being explicit about your commitments and what you believe about morality might actually help you present a more objective picture to your principal than otherwise. Because then you're able to say, instead of just saying, well, this is cost-benefit analysis, let's do it. I, I'm picking on cost-benefit analysis, I apologize, but it's a very common example. Um, instead of saying, this is, C this is what CBA recommends is obviously the right thing, you can say, well, this is what CBA recommends, uh, so if what we care most about is economic efficiency and we care less about uh, equity, for instance, then we should go this way. But someone who cared more about equity might reject it because you know it does other things to equity. 
or what have you. There was a similar idea that went behind the mostly sort of 60s and 70s movement of gonzo journalism, right? The idea was that normal journalists strive for objectivity, but really all this does is hide their biases from the reader. Whereas if you're, if you're a gonzo journalist, if you're Hunter S. Thompson, you just sort of wear your politics on your sleeve, um, then, you know, you're not being objective, but at least your reader can understand, knows where you're coming from, knows what kind of biases uh, she's getting from, from reading you. Uh, I've heard some people make this argument essentially in defense of Fox News. We don't have to have the argument whether or not they're actually biased, but some people have said, look, rather have Fox News than something like CNN. CNN pretends that it's not making any value judgments, but it is all the time. It's got a particular, depending on who you ask, kind of center right or center left bias to its reporting. But Fox News, you know, at least you know what you're getting. You can you can do your own adjustment for the bias if you want. And the last part, and this I'm just going to touch on really briefly, is that being explicit about values might be in some ways required for responsible political action. Uh, the piece from Arendt that I had you read talks about this nightmarish vision of bureaucratic rule as the rule of no man. Um, the idea is that it's easy in a bureaucracy for horrible things to happen while everybody just says, look, I was just implementing, right? It's not my fault that all of these people died because they couldn't get health care. I was just, you know, implementing the mandates we got. Or you know, it's not my fault that uh, the economy is, is, is tanking just implementing the mandate that we, that, that we had from people above. And, you know, you go all the way to the top and you find no one in charge, right? Because even the, you know, even you get to the president and the president will say, look, I'm just giving the people what they want, right? So um, there's certainly, this is an issue that we can't get into adequately here. It's something we can discuss in class, but Arendt thinks that being a responsible political actor requires taking accountability for the decisions you make, not pretending that they are mere value-neutral implementations of decisions that are really made elsewhere, because that leads to a system in our modern state where decisions are essentially made nowhere. So what are the dangers of explicit attention? This? Why doesn't everyone do it? Um, Amy covers this pretty well. One, and we sort of alluded to this already, is that it arguably violates the democratic compact in some way. Uh, all that stuff that I said about, you know, the vague idea that we want healthcare uh, reformed trickling down into thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of administrative regulations, if people are making value judgments all the way along, uh, and especially if they're doing it in a way other than trying to sort of divine what the American people want. It's problematic to figure out what that would be, but if they're, if they're doing it in some other way, um, you could make the case that this violates democracy, right? We voted, we the American people, or we the French people, or we the, you know, whatever de democracy you're in, uh, you know, we wanted X, and if you don't give us X, then something's broken. Right? And this is the sort of complaint that here in the U.S. a lot of people have about our system, where you know people say, oh, it doesn't matter who you vote for, you're going to get what the corporate masters want anyway. Right? There's probably a right-wing version of this as well, but I'm a very stereotypical professor. I hang out with the left -wingers, right? So, um, you know, restraint of one's own moral judgment might be required for respectable democratic bureaucracy-ness. Um, Second worry is that it might threaten the fact-based community. The whole advantage of um, policy analysis was supposed to be that it was not just telling you what, what the politicians want to hear. It was injecting some kind of real rigorous analytic thought into the policy process. And you can see how this might be undermining. If policy analysts are explicit, just say, look, we do our best and we know a lot of economics and we know a lot of statistics, but also we're making moral judgments all the time. It's very easy for this to get painted as, well, they're just, they're just telling you what they believe anyway, what they feel, what their values are. Um, and you can see this coming out in 
arguments over how respected science should be. On the one hand, take something like climate science. On the one hand, you have one camp uh, tearing its hair out saying, look, scientists say that we're baking the earth. We're going to boil ourselves. Um, and, you know, the other people are just saying, well, I don't feel that that's true. They're putting feelings against science. You know, how can you do that? But on the other hand, you know, the other camp will say, well, look, science isn't the final word. Um, and you can imagine if the scientist said, yeah, well, some of what I do is uh, influenced by my value judgments about what's important, that would open the floodgates for exactly the kinds of things that uh, the people who are appealing to the scientists want to appeal to them for. If you're appealing to the GAO in some kind of conflict over policy, or you're appealing to the RAND Corporation or some other you know neutral seeming policy shop, often part of the reason you're appealing to them is implicitly a contrast between the values that are causing you to have the fight and the objectivity of rigorous analysis. So being explicit about how the values creep into the rigorous analysis might undermine that kind of project. Intriguingly, Amy sort of dances around this. This might be a moral question itself. Even if it's true that morality sneaks in to rigorous analysis, maybe we ought to lie, you know, going back to, to Plato's idea of the noble lie, maybe we ought to lie about it. Maybe policy analysts ought to pretend that there's no values in what they're doing. Uh, and finally, it might threaten your job. Uh, as Amy points out, managers are not often in the business of rethinking the entire goal of their agency. Uh, also applies to NGOs. If you go work for um, Peace Now and you decide, you know what, I think this war is actually good, that will not make you popular at work. It might be a serious problem for you. Uh, if you go work for the EPA and you decide that you disagree with the way that the environment is being protected, um, might not go well for you. Uh, if you bring this up with your boss, they may not be that amenable. So, and you can see this even in, uh, you know, things like NGO capture, right? No NGO wants to put itself out of business, even though that's sort of the, the logical telos of their work. Uh, you know, some NGOs sort of mutate as a result of this. So for instance, NARAL, very prominent um, uh, reproductive rights pro-choice organization here in the US, started out as the uh, National Association to Repeal Abortion Law. And then abortion law was repealed by Roe v. Wade. They didn't pack up the organization and go home. They changed the mission. They, they, they altered the mission to do that, um, to, to find something to keep doing. But basic rethinking of the orientation of organizations is difficult and usually something that people don't want to engage in. So what about if it threatens your job? This brings us to the flip side of morality being involved. So far what we've been talking about is the ways in which morality possibly inevitably inserts itself into policy decisions. The way that your values shape policy analysis, even if you are trying your best and most sincerest to be objective. The flip side of this is that you are all human beings. You all have a moral sense in addition to your obligations to your positions or your future positions as analysts. <clears throat> so one of the questions is, how exactly do your own moral convictions interact with the obligations you get for being in a particular role? This gets into the Applebaum stuff. And the reason he starts with the executioner of Paris is that that kind of case shows up a real deep ambivalence in the issue of how far you should submerge your own moral sense into the demands of your role. Because on the one hand, there does seem something odious about the executioner of Paris. Um, one way or the other, he either just doesn't care who the state is executing, right? Because he executes people under both the uh, royal laws and the revolutionary laws, which often contradict themselves. 
you know, or contradict each other, right? Not both sets of rules could be good rules. Um, so either he doesn't care, or um, he, at least half of the time, was executing people that he believed had violated rules that it's not morally wrong to violate. Both of those seem pretty odious when you put it that way. It seems like a bad, maybe you're a bad person if you do that. At the same time, we maybe kind of need people who do that in our society. You might think we don't need executioners, right? You might be against the death penalty, but there's, but that doesn't matter, right? We, we, we need police. I mean, unless you're an anarchist, and if you're an anarchist, we can chat, right? But unless you're an anarchist, we need police. Police will sometimes be expected to enforce laws that they think are bad laws. We need soldiers. Soldiers may be expected, rightly or wrongly, they may be expected to fight in wars that they don't think are justified. We need, you know, members of the Federal Reserve who may sometimes be asked to implement monetary policy they think is wrong, right? Um, so wherever you are, it seems like just saying, well, you always have to follow what your what your you know what your role says, right? Which might include do whatever your superiors say. You know, again, in warfare, long but understood that following orders is not a total excuse for things you might do in war. But on the flip side, we don't probably want to just say, hey, you know what? If you don't agree with what you're being asked to do, that's fine. You don't have to do it, right? That's a that's a recipe for for chaos, for the for the bad kind of anarchy. So Applebaum tries to take this bull by the horns and come up with a limited notion of when it is okay to dissent. The basic idea is that you need to balance the demands of morality of your best understanding of morality with the demands of your role's value to society, right? You want to balance uh, the question of whether or not you're going to hurt society more by failing to do your role, to do your job, um, than you will by uh, doing your job in an immoral way. So Abdelham basically gives you four questions that he thinks you should ask, and we can talk about whether these are the right questions. First is, why do you disagree with the mandate, with what you're being asked to do? Um, and he gives three different kinds of concern you might have um, that roughly correspond to escalating kinds of dissent. You might just think the mandate is not the best policy, right? Um, you're being asked to implement the Affordable Care Act and you like universal health care or you like a total free market, no insurance, fee-for-service system. You don't think it's the best policy. You might object on grounds of justice, right? So you might think it's not that it's, it's not just that it's not the best policy, but it's a policy that actively actively violates people's rights. And these might be different, right? There might be bad policies that we don't have a right to be changed. Um, so the difference would be between uh, the question of um, you know whether having standardized testing high stakes standardized testing in schools is the best way to help children in poverty versus whether we should have racially segregated schools. One might be a bad policy or a good policy, I'm not an education guy. The other one is a matter of rights, most people think. And the last one is what he calls legitimacy, and this has to do with who is giving the order, whether it's within the scope of their ability to give. So um, this, has, this is the sort of thing like I'm probably dating myself by remembering this example, but uh, in the 90s, there was the uh, Iran-Contra, um, actually, no, I took it back in the late 80s, there was the Iran-Contra scandal, where um, it seemed that members of the CIA and military had given the order for weapons to be transferred to the Contras in Nicaragua without at least official authorization from their superiors. So if you were... If you were working for Oliver North um, at the time, you might object to what you're being asked to do, not just on the grounds of, well, do you think it's good to arm the Contras, or whether you think anyone's rights are being violated, but on the grounds that he is not the right person to order you to do this. So, roughly speaking, Applebaum thinks that the, the, the room for dissent 
escalates as you change as you answer this question. If you just think it's not the best policy, probably you should just go along with it anyway. If you think it's actually an illegitimate request, then you might have grounds for outright refusal, whistleblowing, resistance, that sort of thing. So the legitimacy is connected to this jurisdiction question. Do I think the person issuing the mandate had the jurisdiction to do so? The third one's a little bit fuzzy. It's a matter of whether you think the mandate was adopted for the right kind of reasons. So take something like the decision to go to war in Iraq. One kind of dispute bet between someone who favored the war and someone who disfavored it would be, does or did Iraq pose a serious national security threat to the United States and its allies? People might disagree about that with each other, but recognize that the people they disagree with are making the decision for good reasons, for the right kind of reasons. They might say, look, I don't think Iraq is a security threat, but if it was, that would be a good reason to go to war. On the other hand, most people would probably agree if, you know, the worst left-wing nightmares were true and Dick Cheney was sitting in his bunker of evil going, ha ha ha, we need more money for Halliburton by capturing the Iraqi oil, right? That would not just be a bad decision. That would be a decision made for the wrong reasons. Most of us would agree that national security is a good reason to go to war, but getting oil money for a private corporation is not a good reason to go to war. And Applebaum, again, quite plausibly thinks that you have wider scope for dissent if you think the decision is being made for the wrong reasons. And finally, there's the direct question about how your continued service affects the overall democratic virtues of the political society that you are part of. If you think that your dissent, whatever kind of dissent you're planning, public protest, quiet resignation, open defiance, shirking your duties, whatever, if you think that it would do serious damage to democratic values, then perhaps you ought to restrain it. Again, just to pick from my favorite class of examples, military examples come up a lot. Uh, infamously or famously, during the run-up to the Iraq War, General Shinseki, before a congressional hearing, gave a much higher estimate of the troop numbers than the Bush administration had been giving for how many troops would be required for the war in Iraq. And a lot of people very severely criticized him for this. And part of the argument was that even if he was right, the military openly challenging the civilian leadership risks undermining civilian supremacy, which is a bedrock principle for, I mean, a lot of people think he's a bedrock principle for democracy. So a lot of people thought that, uh, and this is why you saw even generals who, high, or other high-ranking military leaders who clearly had doubts about the war from the start, often would not say anything until they had retired, were out of uniform. And this is out of a concern for, um, for the impact of their kind of dissent on the overall structure of civilian control of the military. Now, tied to this, there are going to be some limitations. As we said before, you probably, consistent with the idea that you want to have any sort of institutions in society where people get asked to do things and sort of divide the labor of running a government, you can't justify disobedience for every single time you think that what you're doing is not the best course of action. You've got to think about what the effects are of the institution as a whole and on the government and system as a whole. You really should be asking yourself as part of that, uh, if I obey this thing that I don't think is, is the best thing to do, can I forestall greater evils, either by not undermining the institution or perhaps by remaining an insider, right? You might have more power to fix bad policy if you stay in an organization than if you take a kind of dissent that will end up with you leave, leaving it. Certain kind of humility, right? We shouldn't leave out the possibility that you're wrong, Especially when you're talking about democracy. If lots of other people disagree with you, you might be wrong. So Applebaum, I think, quite reasonably says you should have a certain kind of humility. Uh, if you're being asked to do something you think is, is not right, recognize that you don't have a direct access to what's right. You're in the same boat the rest of us are. You're just trying to figure out the best you can. 
And on a broader level, we might ask, could it be right to dissent or defect or disobey, but also a right to punish the person who is doing that. Um, there might be cases where it said where we say, look, the person who disobeyed did nothing wrong, but also the government did nothing wrong in punishing them. Uh, the clearest kind of case might be one where we think that the person disobeying was sincere but misguided where we might be willing to say they did what their conscience demanded and as they understood it, it was serious enough that they, you know, they ought to have, but they were right, it was right that we punished them because they were, they were in fact incorrect. They were in fact wrong. So, to sum up, and of course, this is scratched only the surface of some of the issues brought up in the reading and I'll be happy to discuss it in class. Part of the reason for doing this kind of value analysis is that values are implicitly, at least, present at many stages of the policy analysis and policy making process. And there are certain potential advantages to making that implicit value influence explicit, to bring it into the open and talking about it. It may make us more responsible, it may make us make better decisions, it may threaten the idea of a neutral bureaucracy implementing democratic decisions. We should we should figure out which one it is. And on top of it, um, beyond the ways in which values can be clarified and used within the system, as an individual, sometimes you will be faced with the question of whether or not you should dissent or resist some uh, something you're being asked to do. And that's going to be a complicated balance between the seriousness, the seriousness of the wrong you are being asked to commit, as best as you can understand it, and the value of your role, the value of someone doing your job to the overall society.